I love what Pastor said a couple of weeks ago when he said, this is technology. Because this technology has been a lot of fun today. Good morning. Ecclesiastes. The story continues. I was talking to Dave this morning, and he said he was talking to somebody, and they had mentioned that they were spending 12, David mentioned we were spending 12 weeks in Ecclesiastes, and he said, wow, 12 weeks in Ecclesiastes, that's a task. It's been a good journey. When we started this, we had 107 days to live. What if? What if we were on our last 107 days? We're at 58 days to live, if I did my math correct. If not, Nathan will correct it next week. In the past almost 50 days, we've seen Annabelle Samuelson go home to be with the Lord. Don Cara. Roy Williamson is my father, my son's father-in-law. Just passed away this last week at 55. And Noah Fowler at 23. We don't know our days. God does, but we don't. And Ecclesiastes is the book about living today. Finding joy in the day-to-day -day life that God has given us. Solomon, the wisest man of the world, of any generation, of any decade. Many will tell you, even uh, physiologists and psychologists and medical doctors will tell you that our brain is not evolving, but actually just the opposite. We're not getting smarter. We're not getting wiser. We're on this decline because of sin and everything else that comes with it in this world of becoming less wise. Now, I know there are so those that would argue with us about this, but the reality is these things, these computers, these phones, these books, allow us to take information from a past generation and push it forward into the next. So we look smarter, we sound smarter, we sound wiser, but the reality is we're not. And there's nothing new under the sun. We'll be in Ecclesiastes 5, 8 through 6, 12. So if you have your Bible, you can turn to there. The title from a message today is Be Present. Be Present. Let's pray. Father, I come to you this morning and as your broken vessel, that somehow, some way, you chose me today to speak these words to your beloved people. So Father, I pray that I get out of the way, that your Holy Spirit steps in, and that Father, as we've spent time and I've spent time going over these verses, that you, Lord, will communicate to each individual heart in this room the specific message you have planned for them. There are no mistakes, Lord. Every life in this room is cherished and precious. And your time is cherished and precious. So, Father, I pray even now we redeem it well. And we will give you all the praise and the glory you deserve. In Jesus' name, all of God's people said, amen. Ecclesiastes is written kind of weird. I don't know if you noticed that. But it's not like Esther, or Nehemiah, it has a beginning, it has a median, it has a plot, it has a subplot, it has heroes and, and villains, and, and there's an end, a conclusion at the end. Well, see, we're Westerners, and Westerners like a linear story, which a lot of the Bible is written that way, a beginning, middle, and end. But Hebrew writing, especially poetry, can be circular. And I don't know if you felt that way, but has anybody here felt like we've been going in circles through Ecclesiastes? Like, here we go again. Like, work is terrible, and family is terrible, and the world is terrible, but there's glory in Jesus. And the circle goes around again. And once again, we find that circle. So I did us a favor, and I pulled us apart a little bit, 
and I made this a little more linear for us. So we're not going to follow the verses specifically in order, and you'll see we dump a skip, because I took the good part, the happy part, the reason why we do all this, and I put it at the end for our Western minds. Solomon warns us against being frustrated with leaders, having wealth without life, family without relationships, and questioning God's plan. These are the four areas we'll look at as we look at these verses today. Ecclesiastes 5, 8 through 9 starts out with a frustration with leaders. But just side note, just curious to see if I'm talking to anybody I might relate to. Anybody here been frustrated with any governmental leaders in the last, I don't know, 20 years, 50, since you were born? Anybody? Okay. See if my people were out there. If you see in a province the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice and the righteousness, do not be amazed at the matter, for the high official is watched by a higher, and there are yet higher ones over them. But this is gain for a land in every way, a king committed to cultivated fields. It can be frustrating at times, but realize this. God guides all leaders in all nations at all times times even when policies and decisions make no sense to us god is taking care of his people always always he has a magnificent plan that he is orchestrating throughout the entire world does that mean that nobody will ever die again no does that mean that people won't have famine in their land and perish no but god knows what he's doing his plan is perfect. It's intentional. It's daily. He's unfolding this perfect plan, just like he did that brought us to a day when Jesus Christ returned. He will do it again when he returns again. When I say return, came for the first time as our, as our baby Messiah. And as Nathan has expressed, we live this life in between the trees and we're waiting for the end. And the question is, how will we live in the present? And that's what Ecclesiastes addresses. And some of us can get very, very consumed with watching CNN or, or headline news or Fox News or whatever your flavor is. And it can be frustrating. But the reality of it is, God's got it. He knows what he's doing. And he's allowing us to be present in this time. A good friend of mine, Greg Kelly, is the director of World Mission, located in Grand Rapids. I was talking to him a couple weeks ago, and, and in our conversation, we were, were speaking about just the world climate. And he pointed something out to me. Greg spends a lot of time in looking at world situations and, and what's happening with evangelism. And he said, it's shocking but the times of greatest growth in Christianity came during the times of hardest persecution. Greatest growth in Christianity during the most difficult times of persecution. Or when the government, or when the, the culture is leaning against. Then we stand. Then we stand. It's pretty easy just to kind of go with the flow as long as the flow is going the way you want it to go. But what happens when the flow shifts? Will you stand in the current? And that's what God calls us to do. To stand in the current, even when it's pushing hard against our ankles, and it's easier just to go downriver with everything else. We stand for Christ in all circumstances. 5, 10, and 12, wealth without life, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with their eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much. But the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. Our money, our finances, the resources we have, those that we have accumulated, are accumulating or will accumulating, accumulate in our lifetime are the thermometer of our financial life. They're the thermometer of our faith. It's the temperature of what you believe. 
If you're wondering how you're doing, oftentimes use this example is like, grab your checkbook, pull it out. Okay, look on your online electronic statement and take a look at your entries. Where are you spending your money? You wanna know where your heart is? Look where your money's going. I know there's a long season that I could flip open the checkbook and look at seeing diapers and sports and school and books and food and food. When you have seven sons, there's a lot of food. This verse about eating and eating, yeah, a lot. And the more we had, the more we had to increase because there's more to feed. If we take a look at our financial picture in our own homes, we can see where our heart is. What are those things that are the most valuable? And when God's calling us to how we get it and use it and give it away, demonstrates who we trust and the level of our faith. What do we do with what we have? If we're a giver, when we have nothing, we'll give. When we have a little bit, we'll give a little more. When we have a medium amount, we'll give more. When we have abundance, we'll give even more. Givers give. Are we? Are we generous with our giving? Do we see the abundance of God lived out when we give? Are we testing him with our giving? Are we giving in such a way that says, Lord, you got to show up because I've committed to this. And I want to see you do amazing work with the resources I contribute. There is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt. And those riches were lost in a bad venture. And his father, he is father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again. Naked as he came and shall take nothing for his toil that the may carry away in his, in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. But what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? Moreover, all his days he eats in darkness and such vexation and sickness and anger. My father lived to be 86 years old. I grew up in a home where every day I came home from school or playing or outside and, and my dad would sit there and I would hear him go how miserable his day of work was. How much he hated work. How hard it was. Now I learned later, to be quite honest with you, he didn't really hate work. He just liked saying he hated work. He was just one of those guys that had a complaint about anything, good or bad. It was, I mean, we, we rooted for the Cowboys during the heyday of winning all the time. But I guarantee you, every Sunday afternoon when I was watching the Cowboys by halftime, we were going to lose. We were going to lose. We were going, it wasn't like the Lions, which they did. We actually won <laughs> often in the second half. So I learned later that he had this natural pessimistic point of view, but I remember purposing and going, you know what? I'm not doing that to my family. I'm not going to come home every day and complain about how miserable I was at work today, how hard work was today. Instead, I was either going to find a career or find a way to find joy in the labor. I was going to find a way. But as I saw what it did to me and how it made me feel for my dad and just about, oh, man, I'd like, as a little kid, I mean, 9, 10, 11 years old, I'm like, oh, dad, it's so hard. You have to go to work today and work so hard. I'm going to go swing on the swing set. You know, and I didn't realize at the time what he was doing to me, but actually changed my course. I purposed and intentionally decided I was going to find joy in my labor. And so I changed jobs a number of times. Sometimes the jobs were hard and really, really difficult. And I had to pray and go, Lord, are you asking me to stick this out? Or is it time for a change? And I always make that decision that I think God impressed upon my heart that says, Kent, when you become more part of the problem than you are the solution, it's time to leave. And I kind of followed that through my whole life. I always tried to be the positive solution. I tried to lean into my work. I tried to be a, a gospel preaching, a gospel living, not by maybe my words, but my actions to those fellow employees around me until I couldn't. And if I couldn't, then I knew it was time to leave. It's time to move on. 
and find a new opportunity to go. How about you? When you come home from work, what is that environment you create? Is it a, do you create an environment of thankfulness and joy because of the provision that God has given you? Or do you now come down and kick the dog because of the da hard day you had at work and the difficulties you challenge you have instead of counting the blessing that you have worked and that God is using it to give you provision to take care of your family? I have to remind myself all the time that I have to be thankful for what God has given to me. There's a beautiful story with my, myself and my dad. My dad and I had a really difficult relationship for a really, really long time. And I had to confront him, quite honestly, about just how negative he always was. But through that and through years and through honest, loving conversations, he got to the place where he actually found joy in his life. And the last uh, three plus years that he lived with us were probably the sweetest years of our life together. Now, dementia may have had something to do with it, but they were precious years that I, I'm so thankful for because of the leaning in of life and relationship, even through the challenging times. There is an evil that I have seen under the sun, and it lies heavy on mankind, a man to whom God gives wealth, possessions, and honor, so that he lacks nothing of all that he desires. Yet God does not give him power to enjoy them, but a stranger enjoys them. This is vanity. It is a grievous evil. Remember, this was written thousands of years ago. Thousands of years ago. Anybody know who Dr. Eugene Landy is? Ring a bell? Probably most of us know, don't know. How about a guy named Brian Wilson? Anybody know? My Beach Boys guys? That's right. Producer, writer, creator, probably the, the brilliance behind the Beach Boys that put them all together and wrote, produced most of the stuff that ever hit the charts. He was given over to conservatorship with Dr. Landy because of drugs, alcohol, and all sorts of problems that ended up taking over his life from 1982 to 1991 at a salary of $430,000 a year. Anybody want to do conservatorship for anybody here? His family, his ex-wife, who had separated from him, actually had to sue him to get control back over Brian's life. Thousands of years ago, Solomon is writing about what we're experiencing today. His word is relevant today. You may know another girl that had the same situation. Her name was Britney Spears, who just recently got control back of her life. $60 million net worth who had no control over any of it. It's a grievous evil to build wealth that somebody else ends up running and controlling. The words of Solomon's wisdom apply today. Everything in this book that we read, everything that we apply works today because the wisest man in the world recorded it for us through the inspiration of God and the Holy Spirit. There is an evil that I have seen under the sun and it lies heavy on mankind. A man to whom God gives wealth, possessions, and honor so that he lacks nothing of all that he desires. Yet God does not give him power to enjoy it. What you have is to be used to worship and glorify God. All your wealth, all your resources, all your gifts. In the end days, when I was with my dad, I was praying really, really hard to get him to understand that he had enough. He had more than enough. He had saved so well. He had saved so diligently. What I would say, even to a fault, because we begged them, my mom and dad, for a decade to come up and see their grandkids. Begged them to come see their kids. Come spend time and see their grandkids. See, see the heritage, the lineage, what they had lived for. My dad could come up for 10 days a year, but that's it. He had to get home. Had to make sure he paid his bills. And it was such a heartbreak for us that he missed so much life experience, that my mom, as collateral, missed so much life experience because he had to save money for an inheritance for his kids. And I was like, we don't need an inheritance. We don't want an inheritance. We don't need your money. Now, in fairness to my father, there's a reason why. My dad was a product of the 1950s. 
in the 1950s, he went to school and graduated early at 16 years old from high school because his dad had divorced his mom. And in Granbury, Texas, he had to go get a job to support his family. So he supported his mom and his sister starting at 16 years old. And he worked, and he worked, and he saved, and he worked. So his whole life, he saved. A few years later, his dad passed away. My grandfather, I never met him. In Texas, there's a law that says you have to leave an inheritance to your children. So he did. To his sister and my dad, they both got a check in the mail. One dollar. It's the minimum that you have to leave your kids. So fast forward, almost 70 years, I understand why my dad was trying to leave us inheritance. And I was trying like crazy to go, Dad, we don't need it. You have enough. He was actually on Social Security in his retirement, was making money. We're making deposits into his account going, Dad, you have more money and more money. You're 83 years old. You don't do anything. You, like you go down to Alexander's and back. Like one tank of gas lasts you three months. Like you're not doing anything. And yet he had to save and he had to save and he had to save to leave his kids an inheritance. With what you have. Lean in to your family. Lean in to your kids. Be part of the conversations. My dad was about 75 years old, and, and my two statements are this. Parents, have the money talk with your adult kids. Kids, initiate the money talk with your parents. I sat down with my mom and dad and go, what's the plan? This is five years before my mom was to pass, almost 10 years before my dad was to pass, but I sat down with them and go, what's the plan? What's the exit strategy? You live miles and miles away from any family, and we need to know what's the plan. And so they, their plan was, well, we plan to, you know, when God calls us home, to go. So I'm sitting at a table in Granbury, Texas, 1,000 miles away in their retired home, and I said, okay, so let me get this straight. The plan is you're both going to die on the same day and walk out of this door into heaven. They literally looked at each other and went, Pretty much. They don't believe in euthanasia. Let's get this clear. They had no plan. They had no exit strategy. They did not know what to do with the house. They did not know. And I said, we need to have a plan. We've got to work this out because you're not going to live forever. And so we did. And we talked through that. My mom ended up five years later, get cancer. We had another talk, another conversation. And believe me, having conversations with money with my dad is a hard conversation. But we did it. And this is what inspired me to do, to sit down with my seven sons, my daughters in love, in a family meeting. And I'm 60 now. I did this when I was 55, 56, 57. And we'll continue to have the conversation and go, what's the plan? When we can no longer care for ourselves, what's the plan? Do we go to a nursing home? Will you take care of us? Do we move out back? Do we sell the house? What's the plan? If I have 57 days left, we need a plan. Have you talked to your parents? Have your parents talked to you as adult children? Do you have a plan? You need a plan. Otherwise, the plan will drive you. And decisions will be made that you have no control over. Either way, it's going to happen. Lean in. Have the critical conversations. You'll be thankful that you did. And the stress of that conversation is way less than the stress of the conversation that will come 5, 10, 50, 20 years later. If a man fa fathers 100 children and lives many years, so I'm not sure if this is why Nathan gave me this passage or not, but if a man fathers 100 children and lives many years so that the days of his years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with, a, with life's good things, and he also has no burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. Solomon rewrites this verse. He actually comes back to this again and talking about how we live, and he, he captures it in Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who built it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early, and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. For he gives to his beloved sheep. 
Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward like arrows in the hand of a warrior, are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies at the gate. Your children are a gift from God. Enjoy them, celebrate them, lean into their lives, have tough conversations. Side note, if you're wondering how to do that, come to the workshop this evening. We'll talk about how to do that <laughs> with each other, with our children, how to tell the truth in love. Your children are a gift. If you're estranged from them, find a way. Mom, dad, find a way. If you're a child that's estranged from your mom and dad, find a way. I get it, okay? This just let's just be clear that that I know that that Jesus speaks into this also and says that children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people, but Jesus said, "Let the ch little children come to me and do not hinder them, for t for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven." Christ loves kids. God loves kids. We're to love kids, our kids. Now. I know that God gives us family to enjoy, but I also live by this axiom that the reason why God gives us family is to force us to spend time with people we normally wouldn't choose to. Think about it. I love my family. I love all of them. And this is not all of them. They keep growing and we can't get pictures fast enough. We don't know how to do Photoshop and drop more in. But we celebrate them, understanding that it's still work. Nathan and I have talked a lot about, even in the marriage workshop, that marriage is work. But it's good work. It's joyful work. It's celebratory work. So are your kids. No matter how mind-numbingly frustrating it can be sometimes, there's so much joy that comes from it. The richest, most thankful joy you'll have is both family, the frustrations of family and brokenness, and the restoration of family, which I've lived through. There's joy in that journey. God gives us family to enjoy them, so enjoy them. Lean in. Whatever has come to be has already been named, and it is known that what man is and what he is, not able to dispute with one stronger than he, Sometimes we get into questioning God's plan. Why are you questioning God? Do you believe that he has a plan for you? Understand that, that most times when we're questioning and crying out for God is because we just don't believe it, that we could possibly be enduring what he has put into our life today. This can't possibly be his plan. In the reality, it is. For such a season and and the trauma the trial the difficulty the challenges we go through is when we are in the crucible of learning when I don't feel like believing when I can't see God's hand is when your faith is growing if you feel it if you see it if I know that it's right here and I can reach out and grab it that requires no faith Faith only happens when I can't see it, when I don't experience it. When I'm struggling to find the peace, faith begins. And he puts us constantly on this planet, Earth, in situations that make us grow our faith. Sometimes it's in our marriage, and it's a, it takes a lot of faith this week, this weekend, because of the challenges that came into our life, to keep hoping on what you have for us. Right? Faith is the hope of the future unseen, but we believe. The more words, the more vanity. And what is the advantage to man? Do I argue with an all knowing God? Anybody had that situation? Anybody argued with God? He does know everything. It's sometimes like arguing with Becky, but most of the time, not quite. Last week. All knowing God. 
I've got more answers than you do. I know better than you do. Live trusting, not fighting with God. There's times I don't understand, but I trust him always that he has my best in mind. For who knows what is good for a man while he lives the few days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow? For who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? Do I believe that God has my best in mind? Do I trust his plan for me? Are we fighting with God? Behold, what I've seen, so here's our circle. I pulled out 5, 18, and 20, and I put it at the end. Behold, what I've seen to be good and fitting is to eat and to drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun, the few days of his life that God has given him. For this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil. This is the gift of God, for he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. I would like to say the end, but that's not the plan. Be present at work, at home, at play, with your family, with your coworkers, with your friends. Be there. When you're there, be there. I probably battled this in my life more than anything else. I'm kind of one of those guys that the most exciting project is the next one. So I'm always jumping from this to this to this. Always struggle with just staying here in the moment. God wants us to be present. When at worship, worship. Push away the side of the week that's coming and the week that was. And trust that you're supposed to be here now to worship. With your family at lunch today around the table, be there. Don't worry about the laundry this afternoon. Don't worry about the homework that has to be done. Don't worry about what's coming up on Monday. Be around the kitchen table. Be around the dining room table. Be with your family. Be there. With your friends this week, be there. At your job, be there. Christ needs you there. He needs his light there. He needs you present there. Be present. Be present. Be present. If you don't know the number of days you have left, be fully present for all of them. Let's pray. Father, you are a great and mighty God. We are thankful, Lord, that you gave us this incredible life to live. Our incredible families, no matter how dysfunctional at times, is a gift from you. Our jobs, no matter how hard or trying or difficult they can be at times, they're from you. They're for us to enjoy, to lean into, to see as a platform for us to share your love. Our relationships, Lord, our friends, our family extended and immediate are all gifts from you so that we might be the light of the gospel in each one of those lives. Father, I pray for my friends here today to be present. In Jesus' name, all of God's people said, amen.